Welcome to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things that you might have missed in The Bad Batch, episode 14. It's a pretty straightforward episode that also laid the groundwork for the future movies with hints to Palpatine's clone that I'll get into later in the video. The episode is titled War Mantle, named after Project War Mantle. This was the Imperial initiative to replace clone troopers and switch regular human troops that we've seen play out in the background over the season. It's named this because it's transferring the mantle of combat from the clones to the human troopers. So when I first saw Attack of the Clones, the description of the clones made me wonder why they ever switched to human troopers. They are totally obedient, taking any order without question. It seems like an army of identical, obedient soldiers would be ideal for any military. But this season has shown us that humans are cheaper in the long run. And as Gregor says, These recruits come from all over the galaxy and swear loyalty to the Empire. They're not as skilled, but there's an endless supply of them. So by recruiting humans from everywhere, everyone has a stake in the Empire's growth and well-being. And referring to humans as an unlimited supply is pretty creepy and foreshadows the child soldiers used by the First Order. Like all of them, I was taken from a family I'll never know. The opening seems copied from the opening scene of E.T., especially the light shining through the trees and the pursuers' faces being hidden. The lizards they're using as hunting dogs are massives. We first saw them in Attack of the Clones, but then again in Season 2 of The Mandalorian. Rex sends the Bad Batch a message while cloaked, kind of similar to Leia in A New Hope. Their mission is to rescue Gregor. Now, he first appeared in the Clone Wars episode Missing in Action, where he had amnesia and had to be convinced to return to the front lines. What's a clone? And of course, years later, he made an appearance with Rex in Star Wars Rebels, leading the life of a sand fisherman along with Wolf. That's how you bore you. I'll gun you down. So when Rex sent the communication, I thought maybe this was a trap and this was another clone pretending to be Rex. And then I realized that you can never fool a clone like that. They would always recognize each other on sight, like dogs. What? I said dogs, not dugs. When we cut to Kamino, the Star Destroyers are hovering directly over the capital, a sign that the Kaminoans are under the thumb of the Empire. Soon, this city will be abandoned just like the facility that Omega explored a few episodes back. The Empire has made a logical choice here. They want to make sure that the Kaminoans can never create another clone army that could oppose their rule. So they're doing what they always do, stripping the place for parts, keeping what they need, and throwing away what they don't want. Hunter uses his Aragorn-like tracking skills to find the Imperial base, where they observe that the troopers have different helmets. Notice that the lead trooper is wearing a design that's similar to a retro clone helmet. This is because it's being worn by your mom. It also differentiates her as a clone who is leading the regular troops. Echo name drops Skako Minor, the planet where the Bad Batch rescued him from the Techno Union in Clone Wars Season 7. So at first, they have a hard time breaking the encryption. As we've seen before, the Empire routinely changes up their codes. It's an older code, sir, but it checks out. They encounter their first TK number, which is the designation given to regular infantry troops. TK-421, why aren't you at your post? I thought it was interesting that in the firefight, the Batch still had their weapons set to stun. They did this against the regular clones, their brothers. Maybe it's just a habit, or maybe they genuinely don't want to hurt anyone that they don't have to. Or maybe it's just that this show airs on Disney Plus and we have to think of the children. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? The music during their rescue is lifted from the rescue mission on the Death Star in New Hope. <laughs> Of course, this is the standard Imperial Alarm. The Empire may have switched over to regular troops, but they're still using Republic Starfighters. This is a Nimbus V-Wing that we first saw in Revenge of the Sith. Now notice that it seems like a hybrid of an A-Wing and a TIE Fighter, indicating that this is right before the galaxy was split between the Empire and the Rebellion. The Arabesh letters in the console read shields active and then later inactive. And I can't believe that someone finally found a use for a gonk droid. That'll do, gonky. That'll do. Hunter is captured by a Republic troop transport like we first saw in Attack of the Clones. Later, he'll come face to face with Crosshair, who still has some of the scarring from the burns that he received on Bracca. Now, we all knew this showdown was coming, and I'm very excited to see how this plays out in the season's last two episodes. And then we go to Kamino. One last time. The Empire has uncovered the Kaminoan plot to flee Imperial rule, and Rampart says, A scientist I have use for. A politician. I do not. Ain't it the truth? Burn the rich. Science is real. In our day. But no, seriously, y'all, the Empire taking away a cloner to work as an indentured servant is a big nod toward the cloning of Palpatine. We already saw this foreshadowed in The Mandalorian. The Empire needed Grogu's blood. To bring order 
back to the galaxy. I theorized in the past that Omega is a Force-sensitive clone, but the Kaminoans kept this a secret from the Empire. This would make her the first Force-sensitive clone, because midi-chlorians don't normally inhabit clone bodies, which is why Palpatine has such a hard time cloning himself and needed Rey's half-clone, half-natural-born body. So, if Lama Su tells them what Omega really is, then the Empire will redouble their efforts to hunt down the Bad Batch next season. So I'm gonna throw out a crazy theory. All right, so Rey is a half-clone of Palpatine, because her dad was a clone of Palpatine, and she's also half-human on her mom's side, so she can have midi-chlorians and be Force-sensitive. All of that's dumb and it sucks, but it's canon, so just go with me for a second. If that's the case, then Omega could only be Force-sensitive if she has human DNA spliced with Jango Fett's. After all, she is blonde, so clearly she's not 100% Jango. So, who else is blonde? Anakin Skywalker. And Anakin visited Kamino several times and even fought in the Battle of Kamino, where he might have spilled some blood. So maybe the cloners spliced Jango Fett's DNA with the best, most Force-sensitive blood in the galaxy. Then Omega would kind of be a daughter to Anakin, making her Luke Skywalker's long-lost sister. Well, that's just what I think. Did you notice any Easter eggs? What do you think about the Anakin Skywalker clone theory? Let me know down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. Thank you.